let me ask you a question. Are you motivated? I mean, I'm motivated to come here and talk to you. But why are you here? Are you motivated uh, because uh, you can't wait to find out some more stuff about uh, motivation? Uh, do you, have you been thinking about that as an instructional designer or as a learner in our program? What motivates you to be here? Is it because you have to be here, but you're really motivated to, to work your way through a program that you value a great deal? And this is just one of the steps you have to go through to get there? Think about what is it? Is it that internal curiosity or is it external events that are drawing you or compelling you to go ahead and, uh, and find out about this stuff and go through this video right now in this course, in this moment, in history. Um, motivation is one of those really elusive, tough things to figure out. Many educators think, in fact, I had, I had a professor one time, he thought motivation was the holy grail. If we could figure out what motivates people and then take advantage of that in how we build learning environments and stuff like that, that we would really be just you know, light years ahead of where we were in instructional design at, the, at that time. Um, he even told me about a couple of his students who had unlocked a really important key and he thought maybe they were very close to finding the Holy Grail. And, but he couldn't tell me about it because they were keeping it quiet because they were going to try and, and, and uh, uh, market it commercially if they really had figured out something. Now, I never saw that thing come <laughs> to pass. I never actually experienced whatever it was those people were, uh, were you know, I don't even know who they were. Um, but uh, I think one of the keys in that was, was he looking for and were they looking for things that you do to people that motivate them? Or were they looking at an, an extrinsic view of motivation? Or were they looking at what is it inside people that drives them to do things? Those intrinsic motivators, those, those, those intrinsic elements of motivation. Uh, because both of those exist in our, in, in our educational worlds, don't they? I mean, we're constantly trying to, to uh, uh, motivate our students by making things interesting or doing particular things uh, in our classrooms or in materials we develop. But really, ultimately, all that is really intended to somehow throw a switch that students ultimately take ownership of their own motivation, that you, you try and put, you put together all the elements that will help make things more motivating or, or ignite motivation. But then it's really up to the learners. It's really up to the users. Are they going to be motivated internally to go ahead and take advantage of whatever it is that's in uh, that you're designing for or whatever you're building. Um, but as instructional designers, we have particular ways of looking at motivation. Um, and there are literally, pro I don't know, dozens probably of uh, models, theories uh, of motivation how and how you can go about that. You'll read about a number of different things. I'm going to concentrate on one because it's it's classic to our field. This uh, uh, it's it's one that's knocked around a lot in instructional design, and I think you I, th I think you'd benefit from knowing about it, even if you don't use it a lot. I don't know whether you will or not, but uh, uh, it was created by John Keller uh, uh, from Florida State University. Um, and it's uh, Keller's ARCS model, A-R-C-S. Attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. Uh, Keller suggested that if we are able to, that each of these things contribute to motivation, that there are things we can do as instructional designers to, um, to manipulate attention, to adjust relevance, to address confidence and promote it, and then also to promote satisfaction in the learner. Um, so 
These are things that Keller talks about that aren't abstract, uh, aren't abstractions. They're things that he's suggesting we attend to in instructional design when we're building things so that, so that we create environments, so that we create products and environments that are more likely to result in the learner becoming motivated, all right? So it's a bit of a two-step. Let's look at them one in turn here, um, just briefly. Uh, attention strategies. How do you build attention? How do you, if you don't get somebody's attention, if they aren't even willing to pay attention to you, you're sure not going to motivate them to learn. So uh, getting attention is one of those prerequisite kinds of things. Um, and gaining attention, you as, as educators, you know that there are dozens and dozens of things that you can do to gain attention in classrooms or in products. But uh, just a few things. Uh, uh, Keller suggested that uh, a one attention strategy is to provoke mental conflict uh, and that that would stimulate epistemic curiosity, um, um, curiosity to gain knowledge. Um, um, so things like, we, we do that all the time, don't we, as educators? We do things like introducing uh, topics problematically to stimulate an attitude of inquiry, okay? Um, uh, Problem-based learning is, is all about this kind of attentioning, isn't it? I mean, it has more uh, underneath the hood, but one of its aspects is to create a conflict, like a problem that people are 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 interested in. In uh, uh, will then become interested in solving. Okay, he suggested that you can use facts that can that contradict past experience. So, if people have a certain kind of experience, you can challenge that experience with a different kind of example or a, par a, a paradoxical example, something that just doesn't work, conflicting opinions or facts or unexpected opinions or even humor to stimulate curiosity, all those things. Um, uh, these can, and you can even invoke a sense of mystery by presenting unresolved problems which may or may not have a solution. You may present people with really authentic problems that they will encounter in life um, everything from climate change to uh, 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 whether or not uh, uh, people should vaccinate them, their kids. Uh, uh, you know, you can, you can create real problems that are mysterious and unresolved uh, and, and, and try and promote, you know, more interest in the topic as a result. One of the best examples, uh, I mean, not one of the best examples, but an example of this. Um, you, you may have heard of the old, uh, the old, the math, um, uh, the math paradox, you know, or the math riddle, where, um, for instance, three, um, three salespeople stop and they, they have to stop in a seedy hotel overnight. Uh, they get stopped, you know, they get trapped in a town and they, so they have to, they have to find a place and they, they don't have much money. And so they, they, they find this seedy hotel for $30. And so they say, well, there's three of us and there's room in it. Why don't we, we'll each pay $10 and we'll, and we'll get this room for $30. And so they do, and they get upstairs and the phone rings and it's the front desk. The desk says, wait a second. You know what? I overcharged you. We're such a seedy hotel. It only costs you twenty-five dollars. So, I'll send uh, I'll, I'll send a bellhop up. Can you imagine that a seedy hotel with a bellhop? But send a bellhop up with your five dollars in, in change. And so, bellhop comes up and knocks on the door and and uh, take the money and you say, Oh, you know, you look at each other and you say, Yeah, you know. We uh, let's go ahead, and since we can't divide five among the three of us, this change, let's go ahead and give the bellhop a two dollar tip, okay? And then we'll just take a dollar each and back, and so so we'll be done with it. And so there they, they do, and then they started thinking, but wait a second, we just paid nine dollars each for the room, right? Paid ten originally, got a dollar back. Each, it cost each of us nine dollars. 
three of us. Nine times three is 27. And we gave the bellhop a $2 tip. That's $29. There was $30. Where's the other dollar? So you can see, that's a mysterious way of saying, wait a second, what happened to that? And by the way, there is a solution to it. But um, uh, uh, it could be presented as a way to provoke attention. Okay, okay another way to... Uh, to develop attention is you can vary the amount of participation. So learners can actively practice in challenging but safe in situations. So, so you can you can put them in to positions that are are really challenging, a little scary sometimes, and allow them to actively practice. And you can vary that depending on their skills and and their tolerance uh, and 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 how much attention you're trying to grab any particular time. Think about in our in our own program how often you're asked to do very real projects. You go work with clients, try and work things out. Your participation is at a very high level. You're mature learners, you're mature educators. And so, you know, the expectations are high that you can get in there and practice in very, very challenging uh, situations. But they're safe. You're under the guidance of a professor who has a lot of experience with those things, set up the experiences, works with the clients as well on the other side to try and make it a relatively um, safe uh, environment for you to work. But that would certainly have your attention. I think whenever you've been in those, those classes that are asking you to do those kinds of projects, you know what I mean. They, they, they're very absorbing. You can also vary the... Uh, the sequencing of elements or events of instruction, that'll maintain uh, attention. So we have expectations that courses are built particular ways and think think about uh, uh, the learning management system in this course and, and how you have different elements and they happen in sequences and very um, predictable after a while. And we do that in distance learning because you want learners to feel like they understand their environments. You don't want to be throwing surprises. Surprise, guess what you're going to do this week? It's going to be completely different in sequence from what you did last week. It might drive you a little crazy. But the, uh, so what we try to do is, is build in some predictability and so that you can understand and you, you, you feel comfortable in your environment. So, um, but if you vary that sequence, you don't have to do it all the time, but once in a while, vary the sequence. And that kind of shakes up the system. And then, and then people are t attending. Like, whoa, I got to pay attention here because I don't, I don't get what's going on. A little bit, that, that's a good thing. Uh, too much of it can probably work against you. Okay. You can vary the overall style of presentation so that the style changes from fast to slow to active to passive to humorous to serious. You can just change things up. and you Or you can have learners engage in practice that allows them to act on their curiosity by exploring and manipulating their own environment. Again, authentic learning environments do that regularly. Now, um, you probably noticed that one of the things that you hear over and over again with this is variance, variable, vary. You keep changing things um, so that it, whether it's the sequence or the, the kinds of things or it's, or if it's participation or uh, vary the, uh, uh, the type of introduction that you use, all of those kinds of things are variants on others and that kind of variance alone promotes uh, attention. And so we can use those kinds of things when we're building products and environments in instructional design. Now the next one in ARCS, A-R-C-S, are relevance. Build relevance. I mean, are there ways, are there strategies we can use when we're designing learning that will help build the relevance of what we're doing? Well, one thing obviously is you can relate the content of practice items or learning items of any kind to the learner's interests and past experiences. 
the more you know about your learners, the more you can take advantage of saying, ah, you know, I'll bet you ran into that. If you were teaching in the North, I'll bet you ran into this kind of situation and this is where this would be relevant to it. You can say that right out loud. You can see how linking into people's experiences and uh, yeah, can help with that. You can also state explicitly how the practice relates to future activities of the learners. I don't think we do this often enough. I think it's a very simple, useful, and reasonable way to go about uh, building relevance. Just say it. Say, if it's relevant, here, let me tell you how, yeah, especially if it's something you aren't sure. Um, in instructional design, if you're talking about uh, uh, usability testing, you can say, here's how you're going to employ that when you're building environments for real clients in real time. And here are going to be the outcomes when you do. Here are some things you can expect to find there. So just say out loud, say, say so it's really relevant. This stuff fits in specifically to what you're going to do. And in fact, this little mini lecture on, on uh, uh, motivation in the ARCS model is really just that of saying this stuff matters to you as instructional designers, as educators in educational technology. This kind of motivational stuff is stuff you can use. It's not just something that exists out there theoretically that you can bounce around and, and think great thoughts about. It's something you can actually employ. Okay, other things. You can use explicit statements about how the instruction builds the learner's existing skills or knowledge. Say, look, here's what you know now. And when we do this, Here's where you're going to be when you do that. Um, give you give you a quick example. We have a, a couple of sequences in the program where um, in in the evaluation courses, let's say the program evaluation courses. Well, in one you're learning about stuff, but in there what we're saying is you're going to after you do this, you're going to go out in an advanced course and find a client. And when you find that client, you're going to apply aspects of what we're learning in this beginning course to that situation. So you're going to build in particular ways on that knowledge, and you're going to gain practical knowledge that we will unpack in, unpack in the in in the course as you go through it. So you can also use analogies or metaphors to connect the present material to processes or concepts or skills um, that are already familiar. To learn. Um, uh, now, analogies and metaphors are tricky business. Um, there are good ones, there are good and bad ones, but in the end, almost every metaphor, I, I can't think of a time I've run into a perfect metaphor, one that holds up forever. <laughs> they ultimately just kind of cave in. I mean, you might have a metaphor of a building. And so now, right now we're going to talk about the foundation and then we're going to build a superstructure on top of the foundation. And then we're going to start building to the outside, to the inside, and in the inside, then we're going to do this. And that relates to learning Irish poetry somehow. Okay. You're going to do all that. But at some point, Irish poetry will probably stand on its own and that metaphor is going to cave in on you. It just won't fit anymore. And so I think that we have to selectively use metaphors and know when to bail out on them. I think that's the big trick, is to say, our metaphor holds, 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 and then here, nah, no, 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 it doesn't fit so well anymore, and not be afraid to walk away from it at that point. Okay. We, another relevant strategy is that we can increase personal interest by including anecdotes or vignettes about noteworthy people in the area of the study. Uh, the obstacles they face, their accomplishments, their consequences. I mean, um, uh, in this course, you, you encounter all kinds of people like, like Bob Gagné and, and, and uh, David Merrill and, and, you know, real icons in the field who've done great things, great work. Uh, Dave Jonason, you've read some of his work. Dave Wiley is out doing, working in open learning environments. You, you're, you're learning a lot about uh, uh, great works done by great people. And finding out more about those people can sometimes be, be useful. Um, um, 
So stories, background stories, things like that often give a rich context for people to understand why they're looking at what they're looking. It builds that relevance because they understand it's a real human being who created those things and uh, a real human being who, uh, who were considering these things in the context of. Okay. You can also... Um, Increase, increase the motivation to change behavior by including learners as role players in a modeling episode. Now, I like to do this, um, especially in our advanced classes, but I love to have people sit down and say, okay, you're meeting with a client right now. I'm going to play the part of the client. Sell me. <laughs> Convince me that I need to invest in doing some needs assessments in uh, in with with the problem you've got in front of you okay and then having those simulated conversations can really be, be powerful learning experiences uh, we can do everything from uh, then turning it around and modeling for people how to do that sort of thing uh, we can even take people to real events uh, and and uh, observe how somebody with expertise in the area and experience in the area um, uh, acts out with those things. One of the things that uh, uh, it's really valuable to have learners go ahead and do that though. You can show people but the the richness of the relevance comes in when you start to incorporate it into your own um, in your own bag of tricks or your own uh, repository of knowledge. Your own epistemic bag. Okay, you can also um, uh, provide an opportunity for learners to practice under conditions uh, of moderate risk so they can achieve standards of excellence. It's always tough. I mean, I mentioned it earlier, but it's, it's tough finding where is that exact right amount of risk. That's a toughie because risk is too high, turns people off, scares them. Uh, risk is too low, it bores them. So you've got to, you've got to find that right risk level. Um, but provide... Um, you can provide meaningful alternative methods of practice for learners to accomplish a goal. They can try things a lot of different ways. They can try it, try it with with each other. They can they they can try it. Uh, uh, they can try things out on paper. They can write about those things. They can just think about them. All of those different methods of practice, actually internal practicing, thinking through, picturing, visualizing ac actions, can be a very powerful method for people to learn all kinds of things. Um, uh, but all of those, varying those kinds of things can help uh, uh, build attention, but then using uh, those alternative methods can help build the relevance. People can start to envision themselves, let's say, in those situations a little more intimately. Okay, our A, R, attention, relevance. C, okay, confidence. How do you, how do you help build confidence with people? When people are more confident, they're willing to risk more, they're willing to do more, they feel better about their learning, they take ownership of their learning more. So, one of the things you can do is uh, clearly state the, the expected performance and evaluation standards of a practice activity. Um, people like to know how they're doing, <laughs> okay? And so if they, if, if they know what's expected clearly, then... Um, and how they're going to be measured against that performance, then that can help build their confidence. They'll feel better that they know where they are. Now, I like to shake up that confidence sometimes, though, and you do too, probably. I like people to be uncertain. I like people to take ownership of their own stuff. <laughs> what do you see as a level of expected performance? And what are you going to do? How are you going to measure your own uh, performance? Uh, uh, against that, that standard that you set for yourself. I think those are powerful techniques for building confidence, but wherever it comes from, whether it's coming from the learner or whether it's coming from you as a designer or educator, um, uh, having those performance standards can be important, you know, and they can play an important role in building that confidence. It's not the only thing you do. Sometimes, like I say, you, you, you shake things up. That's part of the attention. Structure, practice materials, so it's presented in identifiable units. We, we learn 
in instructional design. One of the real tricks and from from uh, cognitive learning theory, it's good to do. You break things into identifiable learning units or chunks, right? We chunk things uh, in our discipline. So uh, we find what's a reasonable amount of stuff that people can practice with, use, employ, because you get too much stuff, it gets too scattered. Um, but if you do too few of things, then you don't have meaningful practice um, or challenging practice. And you want both of those. Again, it's that sweet spot you're looking for of, uh, of structured practice and how big the units of and chunks of material can be that people can apply. It may take some experimentation. It may take some, some uh, uh, formative evaluation to figure out when you've got it about right. Other things you can do, you can begin uh, practice sessions with more easily attainable skills. I mean, that's that's almost a throwaway for educators, isn't it? Start easier, build the more difficult stuff. It's not bad sometimes to say, hey, here's the really tough thing we're going to get to. This is going to be the ultimate challenge you're going to do. Now let's go back and let's build up to it. Okay. Um, you can provide feedback that supports the learner's ability and effort as the determinants of success in practice, in a practice setting. Okay. Um, providing feedback. How much? How little? There's a seminal article a long time ago by Edna Mori on feedback. And she talks a, a lot about how much and what happens uh, with, with learners and the effect on learning when we provide different kinds of feedback to people and and whether or not that feed, the feedback is relevant to the situation, to the moment, to the learner. And uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff. But you can look at the whole area of feedback, cybernetics, feedback uh, a, as an area um, for great investigation. I mean, it's something that you can use different feedback mechanisms and study those. If you're looking for a great thesis topic or a neat project to try and put in place, try messing around in the area of feedback. We know we know a lot about the area, so there's a lot you can try and apply, but there's also still just heaps to learn. Okay, oh, you can also, uh, to build confidence, um, redesign practice items and activities which which frequently cause failure. Okay, um, look for those failure items. I, I've had that in my teaching. I don't, I don't know about you, but I've had those things that I've tried to teach, <coughs> pardon me, a hundred different ways. And I seem to just find a hundred different ways to teach them badly. I don't know. There are certain ideas people can't seem to grasp. Uh, that when I when I try to teach them I, in in media literacy some of the stuff around copyright I've tried to teach and I'm just constantly amazed at how then then that that people just don't get it <laughs> they don't understand what I'm talking about I've I've tried in classrooms standing on tables and saying well wait a minute this is going to be on the exam <laughs> and so write this down now here when I ask you that question here's how you answer that question and I've still had people miss it <laughs> okay so, um, there's again, this is part of the art of what we do, isn't it? But finding those sore points, those those difficult, just those difficult notions, and then working from them can be a really uh, uh, interesting way to build confidence. If you can get, break through those things, find different ways to present them, you can end up with with uh, with learners who are more confident in the long run rather than crushing them with failure all the time. I know you wouldn't do that anyway. What about satisfaction strategies? Now we want people to feel satisfied with their learning. When they feel satisfied, that's internalizing a lot. If I feel satisfied, if I that means that I feel powerful and in control, and I, I feel as though I I own the learning. Um, and I, 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 in some cases, I even express joy in demonstrating uh, that learning, uh, that satisfaction and joy. If we could, if we could align those two, 
if we could get from satisfaction to joy, I think it'd be a wonderful day in learning, wouldn't it? But a lot of things you can try to do. You can try to provide an opportunity to practice using a newly acquired skill in a realistic setting as soon as possible. I mean, it's one of the reasons why music teachers um, have recitals, right? We want people to play. Yeah, you can play out loud and practice all day long on the piano at home. But then when you're stuck in front of an audience, the game is afoot. And uh, that the satisfaction that learners feel when they do that, I think in the arts are just so demonstrably wonderful for this. Uh, um, um, I think of all the times that I've worked in, in drama, in, in theater, and, and that, that people, when, when they finally move from, from rehearsal to opening night, and the satisfaction that's felt when an audience appreciates what's happened. Or even if you finally, with your cast, get something right for the first time, and you almost look at each other on stage and go, oh, that was good. <laughs> or finally, or oh, that wasn't bad. <laughs> but um, having that kind of satisfaction moment is an important thing. And some of them are just quiet little moments of satisfaction we have uh, on our own. If you're, if you're practicing guitar and you finally get that scale right, you can get it, do a pentatonic scale and it feels right and you can move on from that. Uh, and you're able to do it faster and faster and faster and at different scale, levels of the scale. And it's just uh, it's, it's very satisfying. Um, also, having people who've mastered a skill help others practice it. That's a, that's a fun thing we do in, in classrooms all the time. We don't do in online learning enough, I don't think. Say, let's take people who have mastery and help, help them work with others. And of course, there's always that, uh, that pushback that, well, the, you know, these people are learners too, and we don't want to just, way to go, you paid tuition, now let's have you teach the class. I, I, I realize the pushback, and we all have had that from parents or, or, uh, or, or others from time to time, but, or even the students themselves. But um, uh, a, a good combination of, of skilled people with less skilled people in areas can, can often work magic in helping build that satisfaction because people can see themselves moving into uh, an area that one of their colleagues, one of their fellow students already has achieved. Okay, you can reward intrinsically interesting practice uh, uh, with unexpected non-contingent rewards and boring practice tasks with extrinsic anticipated rewards. So in other words, if people love doing it anyway, some there are those natural things, aren't there? Where people are just, they can't wait. Well, you don't have to, what this is really saying is, you don't have to heap on the external motivators. You don't, you don't have to constantly reward people for doing something they love anyway. And in fact, those reward structures, if they're heaped on too much, can actually interfere with that intrinsic uh, satisfaction people feel. Okay? You don't want to give too many rewards for things that are internal to people, right? You, if you do, you want them to be unexpected or non-contingent. It's not because, uh, congratulations, you did that three times. Here's a reward. Um, uh, you don't want to make it contingent on something. You want to just say, you can make it like, I really appreciate what you're doing there. I understand that what you're doing right now is pretty special. Let me tell you why. That is a reward that a, that a good educator can give to somebody. It's not anticipated. Uh, and um, just that kind of verbal feedback, for instance. Boring practice, on the other hand, sometimes you have to just keep reminding people, come on, stay with it here. If you do this, you'll get this badge or you'll get this. <laughs> and just stay with it, stay with it. If you do this, if you use your Starbucks card to buy a holiday drink, um, three times on the weekend, you'll get 200 bonus stars, okay? All right. So that's that's not something maybe that you would normally, it's kind of a boring thing and you might not get around to it, but if you know that there's candy <laughs> at the end of the experience, you might go ahead and make, uh, make the extra effort to do it. We see that all the time in marketing, don't we? Um, 
let's look at Maslow. I mean, if we went back to the, if we tied all this stuff that Keller is talking about in with Maslow, well, a couple of subtleties that are there for, from Maslow, and let's let's revisit those just really quickly. We know that when basic needs are met, that met the drive to survive is replaced with a craving for experience. Okay, we want more. We want, we want more than just survival and getting by and safety stuff. Once we have that, we start looking for more elevated kinds of experience, building self-esteem, self-actualization, things like that. Well, here's a secret, a secret a lot of people don't talk about with Maslow. The intensity of the need at those higher levels is just as intense is at the lower levels. <coughs> Pardon me again. Um, it's we have an intense need to self-actualize, and we feel that as profoundly as we do the need for satisfaction or, or for for safety. We just don't start thinking about it until we feel safe enough to start thinking about it. <laughs> but once we do, it's an intense need. It's an intense driver. And intensity is manifest mentally and affectively. Uh, that intensity, it results in love or feeling for something or, or, or engagement or joy. It's or uh, mental investment in something. All of those things are related to intensity. Focus. When we focus on something very intently, that's an interesting uh, manifestation, manifestation of intensity, isn't it? All right. Now, self-expression is a, a primary activity for enhancing self-esteem. If you want to build self-esteem in people, make them feel better about themselves, have them... In, uh, Make sure that they have avenues for self-expression. Okay, so it's theirs. Is they have ownership of something. That it's 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 not somebody else telling them to learn something abstract or external that then they have to go find and then we they have something that really belongs to somebody else. No, it's when they've internalized that uh, and they uh, they become intense about it. They they express it through in their own way and uh, uh, if we provide opportunities for that as instructional designers we've done a probably a better job of building motivation into whatever it is we're we're doing we've found that users expect to have it their own way learners expect to have it their own way especially in online environments and it uh, they, they want control over entry and exit and operations they can perform in the order they, they, or, uh, um, uh, they, they do them, the order they do them. I mean, if I want it, it should be right there. I should be able to just grab it. Okay? I shouldn't have to go looking for it. I shouldn't have to, to work for the things that are most important to me. Okay? So anticipating that in whatever it is we build and building around that is really a trick. That's an important consideration and it's something to look at for, look for in usability testing and informative evaluation. Um, people want to know they can get in, get out, you know. They want to know that uh, they, they're in control of whatever path that they have ultimately and when they leave, when they bail. But an interesting thing, I was at a conference and Hillary Bryce Davis, she hasn't really written in our field much, but she gave a brilliant talk at a conference I was at. Um, one of the things, she was talking about building um, uh, online learning environments. And she made the point that in design, one of the things that's as important as control, like the learner having that control to do this, is the feeling of control. They don't necessarily have to always express exactly all of their own stuff, but to feel like they could if they wanted to. Now, that's clever, intelligent design if you can get there. Really difficult design, too. It means knowing a lot about learners, but it means that would be very motivating if I thought, if I just 
It's just as motivating for me not to just be in control, but if I feel like I'm in control, good enough. Okay? That's motivating to me. We've, we find that different people approach things differently, left to their own devices. We find that, you know, that kids sometimes find the least educational way to use software. Not always true, but we have to encourage them. We know that kids can use software devices in a lot of ways, but often they're not in positions to use them very intelligently. And so uh, 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 part of our job in developing that kind of um, skill and citizenship too is to find educational and important and learning ways to use uh, the things that they're very used to using in very limited ways okay very skilled ways but limited um, there has been some research that suggests that people under 15 um, navigate differently than their elders <laughs> they they develop different tools for navigating areas they they enjoy uh, walkabout they, they like uh, they enjoy ill-defined environments or environments where they develop different uh, um, different tools for for navigating okay I, I'll find my own way and build that around as long as it's an environment I understand and I feel like I'm in control one of the things I will build is my own way to navigate that environment okay um, people who are over 15 or older seem to enjoy um, more pre-structured environments, structured, structured so that it's there, I know how to use it, I can activate this in order to navigate things. Uh, I like mall maps or diagrams or uh, uh, things like that so that I can say, oh, I'm here, and in order to get here, here's how I go, okay? Um, whereas the very young may care more about uh, finding their own ways and building those ways. By the way, that's excellent research to, to follow up on. I'm not so sure that it holds true in, uh, in certainly in all environments or even in most. And I think taking some of those suppositions and testing them, that has thesis written all over it. Okay, <laughs> I, I think if you can build a, a, a research question around those kinds of things and then try and implement them in different ways, it wouldn't it be interesting to find out if, if um, that initial research finding actually holds any water in the long run. I have, I have questions about it. Um, okay, uh, but rules of thumb, and let's just to summarize really quickly, uh, successful learning events maximize self-esteem a sense of belonging and ownership and intensity. And we do that through goal directedness, whether it's our direction or the learner's direction. I think better the learner defining the, uh, the goals or at least participating in it. Um, connections, content, reflections, and consequences. All of those things involved in in being used as rules of thumb when we're designing things as educators and instructional designers to try and take full advantage of what it means to be uh, to build motivation into our products.